Hey everyone, Chris Sawyer here. Welcome back to the Varietal Show. Um, right now, I'm here in Napa Valley. I'm, I'm sitting here with Steve Mathiason, the great Steve Mathiason and his fabulous brand here, uh, the Mathiason brand. Uh, we are a little distance from each other, like we're sitting at a table at a great restaurant. But instead, we are at Steve's house. Him and his uh, wonderful wife, Jill, who's behind us here talking on Zoom to a really great group uh, who really loves this wine too. Um, we're really just having some fun and talking about really what's going on here in Napa Valley right now. Um, obviously, we've got a fire. Um, it's not. It's about half out, uh, but we've had some problems with that. But the most important thing is that uh, people like wine a lot, and it, it's a real big symbol right now uh, to everyone out there to drink fine wines and actually to share it with good people when you can and I think uh, that's why I chose uh, to come over and unfortunately I was gonna bring some really great people my great friend Cheryl and her family here uh, today uh, from Telluride and, and they have an they regularly live in Dallas but the fact is they couldn't make it and there's just no place to stay here in Napa Valley so I decided to call Steve up and say you know, let's just talk about wine and, and put it on the show instead. So, welcome everyone. Um, Steve, you've uh, been you've been growing grapes. So let me make this real clear to everyone. He's got a winery that started in 2003, but really what got you into this business was as a farmer. Tell us a little bit about okay. your background and, and how you got into farming grapes of all got things. It. Okay. So I, I, re, I always wanted to be a farmer. I didn't care. I just wanted. I was into organic farming. I was an environmentalist since I was a kid. Yep. Saw so Greenpeace came to our school when I was in fourth grade, and it woke me up and been an environmentalist since then. Um, I would go to my family's farm. My cousins had a farm that I would go to in the summers. Um, my parents split up when I was a kid. I got shipped out there for quite some time, and so I just loved that. I loved that everything about it, and and then. Growing up um, into food, into gardening, gardening in high school, gardening in college, brewing beer, yeah. um, really into cycling, and so that kind of drew me to Europe and okay. the whole food and wine tradition in Europe and cheese and that kind of thing. Because most, if you're a cyclist, you you have to go back to the source of yeah. France and Italy, and you get and, and so there's a whole a lot around that. And so I was like, I want to be an organic farmer. And so, but I, we didn't have a farm. Right. That was the, our cousins. And so, went to UC Davis. Yep. To study Where agriculture. I went. Go Aggies. Aggies. Yeah. So, go Aggies. And so that kind of tells you everything that it's the Aggies, right? And yep. so it's like I remember finding out about UC Davis and going, Oh my God! Why, no one ever told me there was a university dedicated to farming. Yep. So I went there. Um, to study sustainable agriculture, got an internship working for a consulting company that worked on um, grapes and almonds, peaches, walnuts, yeah. those four crops. And so I was like, this is amazing. I'm here in Napa, in California. I'm working in agriculture with this consulting company that what they offered to, to their clients was like the farmers would hire them to check the fields for it, pests and diseases yep. and then help them reduce their pesticide use or help them convert to organic farming. That's great. So that was, that was, I got the, you know, and then, so then I was in heaven because I went from being a home beer brewer to a home winemaker. And so I just would pick grapes from the university vineyard or from the client vineyards. And so started in the early nineties, home winemaker and just working in vineyards. And one step led to another, just kept working in vineyards, got another job. Lodi do, uh, doing, Lodi hired me when they got a grant to, to, they want to do the first ever um, sustainability workbook for yep. grapes and so so that was like a deep dive into viticulture because at that point I was five years out of school and so I didn't know that much yep. but we had a phenomenal committee to support it of researchers, industry people and that really set me on this viticulture path. I remember you uh, telling me when I wrote a story about you some years ago about you know Mark Mark Chandler the great Mark, yeah, Chandler, Mark Chandler Mark Chandler Mayor the, of Lodi yeah, Mayor of Lodi Literally now. <laughs> and uh, who uh, we could not judge the state fair this year and he is the grand poopa there um, but you know just how it wasn't just the sustainability it was actually you talking to the farmers and learning little tricks from them Absolutely. kind of really absorbing what they were saying and that was a really an inter interesting thing that you said yeah well you know so what we would do is same thing with the consulting so I, I, I'm like fresh out of school but we'd go around and say well here's how many bugs I counted in your vineyard 
and then talk to then they talk to me about the great market about the soil about their equipment mm -hmm. and in Lodi when we did the workbook there was, it was a self-assessment workbook right. so you, it would take you about half a day to like as a farmer to go through it in all the different categories soil management water management human resources yep. so so we'd go to the to the people and sit at their kitchen table and go through it with them right and we went we did it with over 200 growers wow amazing and, and so the, the stuff you learn sitting at a, someone's kitchen table as they're assessing their whole business for four hours right that was just a, an unbelievable education and yeah. you know yeah the, the all of these considerations that that they're taking into account when they're as great growers yep I agree. I, I just think it's really fascinating. So you come here to Napa Valley, and um, we're sitting here. We're kind of looking up at Mount Veeder, kind of Appalachian right here. Um, Carneros is just uh, kind of to our south here. And, you know, the bigger part of the valley, Oak Knoll and everything is just a – it's not even a mile away, yeah. is it, To mm -hmm. till we're in the Oak Knoll Appalachian. So we're really kind of in the south side of, of Napa Valley. You came, you bought this little property, and you started really building your brand. Uh, tell us a little bit about that how it was to build your brand okay so because we so we started our own consulting company in here in Napa in 2002 that's a farming company yeah vineyard vineyard consulting called premier viticultural services 2002 is I had some partners one of them had the land so he was the first account and then one of them had a man, vineyard management company my job was to tie all this together and try to help them more sustainable better quality you know all the farming stuff right so the home winemaking switched over from Central Valley where we were living grapes to Napa grapes. And I was getting really proud of the wine we were making. And we uncovered this one of this great vineyard that we were, that was one of our clients yep. and said, hey, Jill, we need it. Because I met all these assistant, there's all these assistant winemakers <laughs> here in Napa that have side projects. Oh, yeah. You know, and so I was like, God, there's all these assistant winemakers that have their own small brands. Why don't we do a small brand? Because we have access to the best grapes and that's and I actually have control over the viticulture which is for the the assistant winemakers with their side brands their big challenge was the grapes yeah they would buy the grapes they don't have they, and they were constantly frustrated they didn't have control over the farming right I was like well I have control over the farming let's start our own little brand and, and that was the so 2003 was the first vintage for Matthias and great right. and that was the Merlot Cab Sauv blend 6040 and and then we in 2005, we added on our white wine, which is Rebola, Gialla, Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon, and Friolano. Yep. And those were the two wines, and it was a challenge starting our brand because yep. the whole wine world at that time was doing like the long hang time, higher alcohol transition yep. from, you know, like the, it was like really like 1995 to 2005 transition. Yep. And since I was on the farming side, I was along with the, my fellow people on the farming side, sort of appalled by how late everything was yeah. getting picked, right. Be and um, because the fruit shrivels up, a raisin tastes like a raisin. You yeah. feel like you're losing terroir. We're losing everything we've been working at. Yeah, the winemaking community doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily up on all of the latest viticultural research that's being right. done about light environment and when things are peaking and stuff. And so I just had it. And Jill was working for had worked for years as part of the local food movement for community alliance with family farmers yep. so she was we we're you know we were growing vegetables and eating lighter seasonal food and we wanted wine that went with that so that was kind of the mentality in that era was not that easy i have to say to sell the wine yeah it's uh there you know i don't think even a lot of the psalms were were up to date yet um they they were buying big things and, and everything you know a lot of french style food butter based sauces yeah. i mean you know I think that really a lot of this trend and how you were, you didn't really budge, but then the food trend kind of came back to you. Yeah. You know, where farmers markets became big again and all these things about freshness and, and why freshness is, is so important. Mm -hmm. When we were just talking, when we sat down, we were talking about obviously the glass fire that's that's been going on for a while here. And I said, how, how'd you do? And, and first thing he said is we, we picked it already. So the fact is that you don't have to let these grapes grow forever out there and, and in fact the balance is having natural acidity in there and that's if you let it go too far it gets sweeter and the acidity drops off and then you have to add acidity so why why add things to your wine when you don't have to why not be natural and i think you're 
you're a great spokesperson for that. Um, you know, you won, what, the best winemaker at, in the San Francisco Chronicle a few years ago. And I mean, I, I hold you in high esteem just because you're know, really learning the farming uh, techniques here. Being as natural as possible is a very important thing here in wine country and I think that that's why I like your wine so damn much. Thank you. <laughs> well, the, the, the old saying that, that, that great wine is made in the vineyard yeah. is such a cliche, Yeah. but it's so true. It and, you know, should be. Yeah. And if you can do a good job in the vineyard and that starts with matching the varietal and rootstock to the site and then farming it properly, then you don't have to do a whole lot in the cellar. I mean, it's it's such a truism that everyone says, but but it's hard for a lot of folks to practice it because it's real scary, yeah. you know, and, and um, you want to get the most out of the grapes. But the problem is the most doesn't necessarily mean the most ripe. Yeah. The most out of it might be earlier because it's about balance. Yeah. And balance is a really hard concept as an as a American to get your head around because as American, we're always like bigger is better. Yeah. And so for balance to be better, well, that's tricky. Yeah. What? How do you define it? Where is it? Yeah. And you know, but that's what I'm. I'm chasing that idea of balance, and then, and the if you can find that point, yeah. hopefully viticulture there's a point, and it's not like yeah. multiple curves and exactly. it's muddied. It's like surfing. Is it all wind chopped or is it one wave? If you, if with viticulture you're trying to get it to be one wave, so that you can find that apex and pick. Up on that date, yep. and you don't know when that is. We picked Cabernet this year in August. Wow! I've never picked Cabernet in August before, but we had a really dry spring, and that's when I thought that it was that was the, that point. And I think this has been a pretty consistent. It seemed like every week, all since uh, COVID nineteen started, is pretty much every week was seventies going to eighties, going to nineties, seventies going to eighties, going to nineties. It was pretty consistent there. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. and. Who else has ever had so much time to monitor the temperatures, you guys, except for all of us because of COVID? Yeah, exactly. You know, we know everything about what's happening in our yards today. Um, speaking yeah, of which... Air quality. Yeah, air quality, now. yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, we've got a very interesting grape variety here, the Ribola Giola. Tell us a little okay. bit about this. This is one so, baby um, kind of varietal that you really helped teach me a lot about this. So tell us a little bit about this okay. Italian varietal. So Ribola Gialla, it's the name, it translates to yellow reefer mentor. So I guess it's yellow colored grape and, and it had its tendency, I guess, back in the day to pick back up the next summer. I have no idea where it got that name. But I, I love how some of these, these names, these European grapevine names, when you translate them, they literally, they describe what the actual grape is. Yep. So it's an oldie. It is, this is an oldie. You know, it was on menus written in, like in like in the 1200s like for coronations of kings and stuff in Venice. So it's been in Northern Italy for a long, long time. Um, it's, if we, it's, a, uh, it's not a fruity wine. No. So it's, it's savory and mineral, nutty, and traditionally it's fermented, like other white grapes were traditionally fermented with the skins and stems mm -hmm. like a red grape, right? Yeah. And so, um, it Very has, golden. Yeah. So this this was fermented just like a red grape, all the skins and stems, all the way up until dryness. And so I discovered this variety because we had our my one of my very first clients when we came to Napa, George Vare, he was retired. He'd been in wine industry executive yeah. for thirty years. He ran Behringer, he ran Henry Wine Group, yeah. you name it, right? Unlike uh, most of the folks in those positions, he yeah. loved wine. Yeah. He truly loved wine. And so he wasn't a bean counter. Not a bean That's counter. No bean counter here. No widget pushing, <laughs> you know. And so he so um, he would have a lot of conflict with his cronies actually because he believed that you your wine business would actually do better if you loved the product. Which most businesses people say don't fall in love with your product, right? But wine wine is different. Wine has emotion and you have to understand that. And so for his so the, so for his retirement, he wanted he had fallen in love with Rubola on multiple trips to Italy. It's completely impractical. It's yeah. impractical in Italy. It's impractical in Italy. They can't they sell very much Rubola Gialla. No. The Rubola producers mostly do Pinot Grigio and yeah. Sauvignon and Chardonnay and stuff. Yeah. So so he was like, for my retirement, I'm going Rubola Gialla. And I'm his vineyard manager, going, what the hell are you, are you <laughs> thinking? You smuggled in these sticks of, of this variety that we've never heard of from Northern Italy. We grafted it in the vineyard and then it was full, had all these viruses. It grew really funny. 
and um, and then we pick they pick the grapes for the first time. He picks the grapes. I go into the to his garage where he's making his wine, and they're and he's fermenting. He's doing punch downs. I'm yeah. going, what the heck? It's a white wine. Yeah. And he says, no, that's how we that's how they do it in Italy. They they um, it's just like a red. Yeah. This, which completely blew my mind. That was like 2003, right? Yeah. I don't know when the term orange wine was coined. Yeah, but it's more, like more recently. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, more recently for sure. So it was just like the whole thing about this blew my mind, and set and it was just like. So and set like me on a whole path of like realizing there's so much more to wine than, mm-hmm. than you know what we're used to seeing. Absolutely. In so many different ways. But so so when so when we bought this property in 2006, the very first thing we did was gather some of the Ribola cuttings and graft them here. Yep. And then we started making our um, that wine here on on the property. We didn't take it to a winery, so right. all the yeast that fermented it would be from this property. And we thought it was the best, the highest expression of terroir is literally make the wine in the actual vineyard where yeah. the grapes are from. And that's how we started doing this skin fermented Ribola. It's fantastic. You know what it really, it reminds me a lot of uh, when I went to, um, when I went to Austria a number of years ago and tasting Gruner, but Gruner has a very interesting accent to it. It almost smells more like um, uh a pomelo, um, mm-hmm. which is a grapefruit and a, a, a lemon together, and then it's got that little white pepper kind of note to it too, especially mm-hmm. on this nose. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a, we think it's rustic, but it's actually just European kinds yeah. of. Um, and right there, what you said, savory. This is a savory white wine. This is not. This is a showy. You know, everything's all out there on the the board. You know, a bunch of vanilla y kinds of components, and mm-hmm. you know, all these candies and and things like that. This is like real earth. I mean, this is like yeah. the real deal. It's really about where we're at too, which is on the kind of the floodplains here. You know, this was you know the old orchards uh, right here in Napa Valley. When I was a kid, I used to come here. And these were a bunch of orchards here. I mean, yeah. or cow grazing or whatever it was. This property was prunes. This is prunes exactly, which was a huge commodity here in Napa Valley for a long, mm-hmm. long time, especially in the seventies when I was a kid. So. It's such a neat departure from the regular norm that we think about with a bunch of Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc, which Napa is best known for. Mm-hmm. But here's something very different, and I feel very European just having each sip. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's interesting that you mentioned white pepper. Yeah. So one of the things that I, I've um, like learned over the years and really been starting to get more comfortable with is that we don't have to spray the vines so much right. to control the powdery mildew that grows right. in the vines. I really think that we're that we're creating these vines that are like we spray so much and that, and I count that with organic yeah, as yeah. well because with organic you still use sulfur and oils and you're still battling powdery mildew. But so we have these perfectly clean vineyards. I'm gonna put clean in quotes, and it's like the grapevines don't have to use their own immune system. Right. And so one thing so I've been experimenting with, well, maybe we can back off a little bit, right? right? And allow a little bit of powdery mildew. Is that hurting anything? Yeah. Well what I've learned is white pepper yeah you get more if you leave a little bit of powdery mildew out there you get more ripeness right better phenolics lower sugar levels and some really interesting notes and white pepper being one of them that we when you said old world yeah. because the it rains so much in Europe oh, that yeah. they have a lot more problems with powdery mildew than we do so there's a, there's often a little bit of mildew out there right. and and so I've our, the wine, our wines, if we, we just allow a little bit of, we're not, of, of the, some of the natural powdery mildews and detritus and things that just grow in the grapes a little bit, you you get more complexity in, yeah. the, in the aromatics. Yeah. And, it, and it brings I you love back. It. Yeah. It's so great. Well, what a great wine. It's and you just can fun. save on sprays, you know? Yeah, exactly. More natural. Um, I love it. So, you know, you you make red wines too, obviously. Um, we're, we've got a red wine right here. This is the, uh, um, the 2015. Um, a really nice one as well. And tell us a little bit about this blend. Okay, so this is Schio Patino. So this is a really rare variety. This was actually outlawed in Italy. Yeah. Um, this Schio Patino. Folks, Blanco Chiala brought it back from extinction, basically, in the 70s, I believe. Yep. Um, it's the other name for it is Ribola Nero. Yeah. And so we thought, well, Ribola Jala does well here. Let's try Ribola Nero. And we were lucky enough that they had some of the um, plants at UC Davis in the variety collection. Mm-hmm. You want to talk about white pepper. It's crazy yeah. white pepper. If you love, like, 
um, Northern Roan spice. Yeah. This is like Northern Roan turned up to like 15. <laughs> exactly. It's crazy nose. That's why I wanted to pour it for you. No, I really appreciate that. The minute I walked up, he had this poured for me. I was like, ooh, yay, let's do this. No. Yeah, we only make like 80 cases of Schio Pacino. We don't, we don't even have enough to put it in the wine club. Yeah, it's 12.1% uh, alcohol, you guys. I mean, this is not... You can drink a you know like a half a bottle of this and you're fine you know and you're having it with food which is the whole concept of wine really is to really have it with food and I mean yeah. that's why when you're talking about Jill and your your food heritage here in this family is a big deal just like it's in mine and and I hope a lot of everyone out there that's watching this show right now is, are big foodies um, mm -hmm. and, or wannabes and you can we can help that for sure yeah. but you know the fact is you go to Europe. You eat food with, uh, there's always wine and food together. You, yeah. it's just, you just don't do it by itself, you know? That's not the whole idea there. Yeah, exactly. And they were they were alive before us, a lot of us people. Yeah, it's called Europe, you guys. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I love how it's an application of a European kind of grape, but brought here and, you know, you're kind of preserving this heritage of this grape variety too, in many ways. And bringing yeah. it here and, and enlightening a lot of us to these grape varieties, which I've tried this before, and there are certain places, you know, actually another good um, team that has some of this growing in their um, property, I don't know if you know Desky Estes and, and John Stewart, who owns Zazu and and some of those. Oh, uh, hold, hold, is that... Um I do not know them. Yeah, they're two great chefs over in um, Sonoma County. So sometime I'll introduce you to those two. But wow, okay. great, yeah, like great chefs, them. and they have got got a little bit of this growing in their yard. Oh, I awesome. think it came with the yard for some reason. Well, this is in Forestville so, of all places. Because Holdridge Sellers in in um, yeah. Wilkesburg used yeah. to have some skew. I think makes it's makes some skew patino. I wonder if they sold I, them. I think I think it's I think it's from them. If I'm not mistaken, okay. we know John Holdridge too. I'm not surprised if that was your grapes. Yeah, or you were getting those grapes. That's John the only other Schiopatino I'm aware of in the country. I don't know of any yeah. other Schiopatino. It's probably from their vineyard. Uh, yeah. I would not doubt that at all. So, you know, here we go into another grape variety. Let's just talk about Italy for one second, you guys. I mean, Italy has more grape varieties in it than any country in the world. Remember, Caesar kind of liked wine, and he'd go to other countries, take them over, and take their grape cuttings and start propagating them in Italy. And then he'd also send his his workers there to these different uh, countries or what were provinces at that point, and actually educate them on how to um, actually how to farm. Uh, so there's some really nice things there too. But you know, when you look at the top uh, countries of the world that have the most grape varieties, that's one, that's number one by far. And then you've got like Portugal and France and some of these other great places. But, um, you know, Italy is just, we learn so much about food and wine from Italy. There's no doubt about that. But this is two really marvelous, marvelous grape varieties that really kind of go along the same genus. Um, one's white, one's red, and they're both Italian. There's no doubt about that. Very cool. So you work with... Um, other grapes. Here we are in Napa Valley. It's not. It, this doesn't cover everything, you guys. This is like so, eighty cases. Yeah. <laughs> it's eighty cases. So you you did bring up your first wine was Merlot and Cabernet. Mm -hmm. What what do you like about Merlot here in Napa Valley? Why does it work? Well, so our Merlot is here down here in the Oak Knoll yep. area because Oak Knoll is the coolest portion of the Napa Valley, other than Carneros, right? From the it's because it goes warmer as you get up, cooler as you go down because we're closest to the bay. Right. Merlot is a shorter ripening cycle than Cabernet Sauvignon, and Merlot, Merlot is also not as sensitive, it's not as um, drought tolerant as Cabernet Sauvignon, right. and you have more clay in the soil down right. here in Oak Knoll. So really suited to, to Merlot is really suited to this place here. And you know, we have the cool nights, mo moderate days, cool nights. Yep. Merlot, in which Merlot, because Merlot has, for Merlot it has the, the cool nights and it can be slow enough in its ripening, it's really aromatic. Very and, aromatic. And I like aromatics in, in wines. I'm not, a lot, lot of winemakers will always talk, will talk a lot about texture. Yeah. I'm, I'm personally, I'm not a texture guy, I'm, yeah. a, I, I'm into the aromatics. Me too. And you know, it's, it's just so much more interesting, right? The complexity. Yeah. Um, and so I can put up with a, maybe if it's, the tannins aren't just right, if the, if the smell draws me in. Right. And, you know, you know and, and it's funny, we're just talking about Merlot right now. Immediately the wind starts blowing. You know, we, you can see behind us it's starting to blow right now. 
And this is a, a common everyday thing. It comes in through the um, Carneros, through the Petaluma Gap, through Carneros to us here. And it's a great thing. It's a real... Uh, 3.30 in the afternoon. You just it's almost set your yeah, watch clock, to it. clockwork. You know, it's, it's going to happen. And here we are. It preserves that acidity in there and it allows them to ripen slowly. Um, but, well, you know, without addicts. getting too big either. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're not yeah. really going for the big gusto style you know, uh, like you do kind of in the deeper parts of the valley. Mm -hmm. uh, don't get me wrong, there are great uh, little sub areas of Calistoga even, that's the hottest area, oh, yeah. but there's areas there where, you know when you go for a hike and you walk by this one little patch and you obviously have to tie your shoe now because you're really hot and there's that cool air breezing through there. There are those little nooks and crannies here in this valley, all over this even, valley. Yeah, even Calistoga because they get that gap through through Knights Valley that you yep. come down and get that breeze if you're in the right spot. Yeah. And then the soils, I mean, Three Palms is what, what you know. It's one of the most Merlots. legendary uh, yeah. Merlot vineyards in the world. Um, yeah. And it was number one in the Wine Spectator and, and Duckhorns Merlot. I mean, Merlot for a lot of you guys out there that saw Sideways, ooh, like it's not out of style. It was always in style. The problem is that there are a lot of people that used it as a commodity instead of a real grape and that's where it went bad and if you really watch the movie sideways too don't forget that the the end scene is actually him drinking Cheval Blanc which has Merlot in it yeah. um, so Phenomenal. it was kind of a kind of an interesting thing but I would argue right now that the best Merlots we've ever had in America are being grown right now and made right now well you know because since after sideways weirdly probably did Merlot a bit of a favor because yep. it was so over planted and all these spots that aren't suited to it. And I, mean, I don't think it's an exaggeration in Napa at least to say that the number of Merlot acres after sideways reduced by probably 80%. Yep. And so the only Merlot vineyards that are left for the most part are places that Merlot works really well in. Ex extremely well, like Paloma and, and uh, you know, uh, Three Palms and, and all these yeah. little nooks and crannies. I was talking with uh, the great Kimberly Nichols from uh, Markham today and about all the different kinds of places she gets. A lot of Yontville, a lot of Oak Knoll. Mm -hmm. That's her kind of concentration mm -hmm. right there. It's a great area right out here that we're looking at. And so... I think that's a great thing. You work with Cabernet too because mm -hmm. it's Napa Valley. Um, it happens to grow really well here. <laughs> it's like that's one of the news flashes. Huh? Cab does well in Napa Valley. Yeah, Ooh, but it actually, go figure. you know, yeah, it, it, it actually, it actually does do well in Napa Valley. Yeah. It's a yeah. really great grape. It's a you know the I think the wonders of Cabernet Sauvignon are the fact that you can blend a lot of stuff with it too, you know. So it's not just about Cab, especially here. A lot of times, I mean, you're getting Cabernet Franc in there, you're getting Petit Verdot, yeah. you're getting Merlot to soften it a little we bit. We always blend our Cabernet. Yeah, this is a single vineyard. Yeah, and remember that's the way they do it in Europe. They do it in Bordeaux. It is never 100% Cabernet or Merlot there. It's always a blending process and finding the best batch. And, and the percentages are not always the same. I mean, you've got so much to talk about. Well, like Cabernet is so assertive that it, you can that you can blend it without losing the character. That's what's yeah. you know, like to me, I always think of like the because you can really separate winemaking into the Burgundian tradition or the Bordeaux tradition. In Burgundy, you don't if you want to make a great Pinot Noir, you don't blend it. Yeah. And so the way I, I was thinking about it, I was like, well, Pinot Noir is like watercolors. Yeah. If you blend, blend them, they turn, this turns brown and you got yeah. nothing. Cabernet is like oil paint. Right. You can layer it right. and it holds, it holds the color. Exactly. I mean, I think that this is such a great conversation. I mean, it, it, especially your devotion to learning these lessons along the way. I mean, you've been doing this for a while. Uh, you know, you and I have been friends for a while and it's been fun following you and to talk to you about these kinds of things and, and things that this man gets excited about grapes. You know, you, yeah. you are excited. You're an excitable guy, you know, and that's I, I think why we get along so well together is just to talking about this stuff makes us energetic. It's and fun. Yeah. It's fun. And that's the way wine country should be. You know, it's just having a good time. And I hope you guys have enjoyed this, what we've been talking about with these Matthiasen wines. And, you know, you can find this uh, right on the Matthiasen Family Vineyards uh, website. Um, uh, you know, you can find these great wines. You can get your bottles, too, and really try this stuff out. I really appreciate you guys watching once again. 
Steve, thanks once again for having me over. Thank you. Yeah, it's so fun. I love this guy. So thanks once again Cheers. for tuning in to the amazing varietal show. And we are definitely talking about some crazy ones today. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Cheers. Bye.